Welcome to Pathway, we're so glad you're with us today. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We invite you to fill out a digital connect card on the PCC at Home app or pccfw.tv or text the word connect to Pathway text number. To all of you who have continued to give support financially during this time, we wanna say thank you. We're so grateful and we want you to know that from online worship to Pathway groups to community outreach, your generosity has made ministry possible. If you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. There are give buttons on our website at pccfw.tv and on the PCC at Home mobile app. You can also text the word give to our text number or you can mail a check to the PCC office. For all the latest COVID related updates, be sure to visit our website. Just click the red banner at the top of the page to view new announcements and find quick links for Kid City Online, content for students, adults, and more. You can also access all of this through the COVID link on the PCC at Home app. As always, our services will continue to air at pccfw.tv, so if your health is vulnerable, we hope you'll continue to be part of our online community. Thanks again for choosing to show up here.
What a great way for us to kind of gather and start our in-person services this year celebrating what God has done and knowing and having faith that he will continue to do great things. I'm sure like many of you, I woke up on New Year's Day and I kind of hope that the tension and that the kind of the tide of all the chaos that we've experienced in the last year, that it would just kind of somehow be gone. And then I woke up and I realized it hadn't. And I almost feel like in the past couple of weeks, it just seems like it's almost worse somehow. And I think as people that call themselves Christ followers, I think in this time in the past year and then as we look towards this year, sometimes we're asking ourselves, what can we do? How should we be living? How should we behave? How can we make a difference? I think the answer really is pretty simple. It's love. It's by putting on what Christ came to show us in such a perfect way, love. And we could go through Corinthians 13 where it talks about being patient and being kind, being gentle, full of self-control, not keeping a record of wrongs. The best thing we can do is to die to ourselves and put on Christ. So as we continue to sing this morning, I want us to really think about that, how we can put on Christ and have him radiate through us to those around us. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's sing and let's reflect on Christ being magnified through us this morning together. We're creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift wood cry and from north to south in the east we hear Christ be magnified we're the
trials we face, no matter where we find ourselves, Lord, in the relationships, Lord, or the work, or Lord, even in our own minds, Lord, you are the same. You are our ever-present help in time of trouble. We call on you this morning. Lord, I pray, Lord, that this morning, if there are those here, Lord, that are just seeking, Lord, that just trying to figure out what faith means, Lord, I pray that uh, that you help them come to understand the truth of the gospel, Lord, that you sent your son to this earth to live among us, to go to the cross carrying our sin and our burdens and our shame, and that he died and was buried, but then on the third day he rose because of that, Lord, we have hope to spend eternity with you. I pray, Lord, that that gives us confidence, Lord, in the way that we live, in the relationships that we're in, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you help us to radiate love to those around us, Lord. Continue to show them who you are and what you're all about. We love you, Heavenly Father. We're so grateful, Lord, that we can come, we can sing out these praises, Lord, and be reminded again who you are, and what you have done, and how we should live because of that. It's in your name I pray, and everyone said, amen. We have so much going at us these days, and I know that 2020 felt like the outward pressures that we were being faced with were doing all sorts of things into our heart, with our hearts, and then as Isaac was saying, we were all kind of hoping 2021 would be a little bit different, we could breathe a little bit, well, it hasn't been so far, and uh, the other day I was realizing something, and that is I really realized that with all the stuff coming out, it seems like more and more and more and more and more that at some point you've got to step back and you've got to say, okay, instead of attending to what's going on out here, I need to make certain that I'm taking care of what's going on in here. Because our outer worlds have a profound impact on what happens on our inner worlds. And if we're not careful, we can easily allow the outer world to squeeze out the work that the Lord wants to do in your inner world, particularly the the work that He wants to do within your soul. So this morning, I want to ask you a question. I'd encourage you to write this question down and think about it through the rest of 2021, since we're just starting. How's your soul? How's your soul? Are you finding that you're allowing more of what's going on out here to, to really uh, redirect what God wants to do in here? Or are you, are you really stepping back at times and saying, I need to give more time to the addressing the needs of of my soul, paying attention to my soul. Just a few questions. What steps are you taking to be more aware of what the Spirit of God is saying to you and teaching you and transforming you? Are you taking some time to do that? Do you find yourself growing more in the fruit of the Spirit these days? Your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness, your love, your self-control? Are you giving into the fears and worries and anxiety and anger more than trusting the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do 
in you through those situations that are causing you to feel all those emotions that come outside of you? Is your season of loss, and some of you have gone through significant loss in 2020, even in 2021 already, is it taking you to the cross and to Jesus who identifies with with your pain and your struggles and invites you to move towards him? Are you giving into to, to, to are you giving into temptation or, or are you praying for the provisions of the Spirit, of His strength and His power and His wisdom? Is 2021 going to be just like any other year, like it was last year? Or will this year be when you make adjustments in your life to care more for your soul by slowing down more, by being more intentional and cultivating your personal relationship with Jesus so you find yourself living and loving more fully like Jesus did and how Jesus wants you to live? Will this next year, will this year, 2021, be a year that you intentionally make prayer a priority in your relationship with Jesus? And I'm not just simply talking, saying a little simple prayer, but actually cultivating this communicating relationship between you and the Father in a way that it begins to truly transform you. That's what I want to talk about this morning, this issue of more prayer. I find it interesting, grab your outlines, pull them out. I find it interesting that uh, when you look at the life of Jesus and you look through the ministry of Jesus, particularly with his disciples, the disciples experienced so much of Jesus. They experienced Jesus turning water into wine. They experienced Jesus walking on the water. They experienced Jesus raising the dead. They experienced Jesus healing those who, who were paralyzed and, and had been lame for life. They, they witnessed Jesus take, take a, a few loaves of bread and a couple fish and feed 5,000, another occasion to feed 4,000 plus They watched all this happen, and yet the one thing they did is when they came to Jesus, they didn't ask him, hey, Jesus, can you teach us how to walk on water? Can you teach us how to turn that water into wine? Can you teach us how to raise that dead? Can you teach us how to do these things? No, they came to Jesus, and they asked him just one simple question on one occasion. They said, Jesus, teach us how to what? Pray. Teach us how to pray. Exactly. And I don't know why that was. I thought about that. I thought, you know, why was it? Well, I think they saw more joy in Jesus. They saw more of a sense of purpose in Jesus. They witnessed Jesus more aware to those around them. I mean, take some time this next year and read through the Gospels. And every time you see the word he saw or Jesus saw, circle it and just look at how attentive Jesus was to those around him. It stopped him in his tracks and caused him at times to minister deeply to them. They saw him living more expectantly than anxiously. They saw him more content opposed to wanting to get more. They witnessed in Jesus a deeper affection, intimacy, and dependency, and trust in God. They saw Jesus living a full life in the midst of all the pressures that he faced, just like the pressures that we face. His prayers served to feed his soul. And when he prayed, things happened. His life was busy, but his heart was not, and they wanted to learn how to pray that way. And let me tell you what prayer does when you begin to to really take time to set it aside and to make it a a critical part of your relationship with Jesus Christ, praying like Jesus prayed. Let me tell you what prayer does for you, a big idea, and that is that prayer releases more of God's provisions and presence in your life. You become more aware of, of his provisions of strength in your weakness, more aware of the wisdom that he gives you in the midst of your trial, more aware of the ability to find a way out in the midst of a temptation. More aware of the comfort that you need in a season of brokenness. Uh, more aware of the fact that, that it's God who provides you with the, with the success that you've been given. And you walk through that with a deeper sense of humility. And you become more and more aware that you are not alone, but that his presence is right there with you. Matter of fact, Richard Foster said it so well. He said, all who have walked with God have viewed prayer as the main business of their lives. And so Jesus taught a little bit about prayer. Matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. And uh, let me just kind of set this up for you. If you go to Matthew 5 through 7, it's the Sermon on the Mount. Again, Jesus looked around one day and he saw all these people and he decided, I'm going to teach them some things about life. And, And so he does just that. He starts with the Beatitudes, which is really about giving up power in your relationships. And then he begins to talk about all these doors that you need to shut within your life. He's saying, you know, instead of putting up walls with others, kind of shut that door and be reconciled with others. Instead of seeking revenge, shut that door and turn the other cheek. Instead of uh, just going after your enemies, shut the door and love them instead. Instead of building up more pride, shut it and begin to give out of your life and the abundance of your life in secret. When it comes to your money, 
Shut the door. Don't let it take control of your life, but, but store up treasures within heaven. When it comes to criticism, stop judging. Shut the door. When it comes to, wor- to control, stop worrying and do not worry. And then he says, but open up this door and this doorway to prayer. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, 5 through 13, some really good instructions for us, some real practical handles to hang on to as we talk about prayer this morning. He says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. But truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into a room. And that word room is an interesting, interesting word because a lot of times what we tend to think with this is we, we tend to have this idea of a prayer closet, you know, that they went to a closet in their house. Well, the truth is in Jesus' day, there, there wasn't three bedrooms and two full baths and, and a house off to the side to park your chariots in. Um, you know, it was just, it was a, these were very small little places. And, but typically, there would be a room where you would keep your treasure. You'd keep those things that you treasure. And so it's like going into the treasure room. It's almost like Jesus saying, go into that room where you keep all those treasures, just to keep them all in perspective, more or less. Realize who gave them to you in the first place. And he says, but go into that room, close the door, and pray to your who? Yeah, this is a good interactive moment. Down here, upstairs, online as well. Let's try starting 2021 off right. Can we do that? All right, whatever. Here we go. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your... Yeah, who is unseen, then your who sees what is done in secret rewards you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, what are some, some ways, some practical handles we can hang on to that Jesus really gives to us in the midst of this little instruction here on prayer? Here's the first one. That is, just pray consistently. Find a place to give God space. Find a place to give God space. I mean, you do not create, uh, you do not create intimacy. What you do is you make room for intimacy. That's true in every relationship that we have. The one thing that will rob us of intimacy is our busyness. Someone put it so well that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Both sin and busyness have the same effect. They cut off connection to God, to other people, and even to our own soul. That is why in the midst of a busy life, Jesus would retreat to solitary places. He would find a way to get away from the crowd. They would often find him, but he'd find a way to get away because he knew that he had to care and attend for his soul. He had to care for his soul. How's your soul today? Unless we intentionally create time to spend with God, our sin nature will lead us to spend time with other things and other people. And when it comes to prayer, what's true about prayer and true about intimacy as well within our relationships is this. That is that life crowds out prayer. It crowds out prayer. You get up in the morning and you think, I'm going to spend some time in prayer. And then then the kids show up, and, and, uh, and then or, or an issue shows up, or you walk into work, and you're going to take some time, and then a problem shows up, and, and you begin to find that the thing that you need to spend time on actually gets crowded out, and it gets crowded out by your work. Now listen, if Jesus took time to be with the Father, how much more should we? Uh, Paul Miller has written a, a really, really great book on prayer. Matter of fact, over break, it's it's a book that I had on my shelf a couple years ago, and I pulled it off and started reading it. It's called A Praying Life by Paul Miller. It's a really, really good book on prayer. He makes this statement. He said, you'd think if Jesus was the Son of God, he would need to pray. He wouldn't, wouldn't need to pray, or at least he wouldn't need a specific prayer time because he'd be in such a constant state of prayer. You'd expect him to have a direct line to his heavenly Father, like broadband to heaven. At, least, at the least, you'd think Jesus could do a better job of tuning out the noise of the world but surprisingly, Jesus seemed to the need to need time with God just as much as we do. So here's my question for you this morning. When do you pray? When do you pray? Uh, a few weeks ago, I kind of asked the question, uh, same kind of question, and uh, there was a mom and dad on the front row. It's on Saturday night. They had their kids down the front row, and they were doing a great job of, of keeping control of the kids. And she came up to me after the service. She says, I pray all the time. <laughs> I said, 
<laughs> I can see. I can understand why. And, uh, and she said, no, I really do. She said, I, I don't have a set time. But she said, I'm praying. I'm praying when I'm alone. I'm praying in the van after I take them to school. I'm, I, I'm praying when, when I'm just kind of working around the house on my own. And really what she was doing there is she was doing what Brother Lawrence called practicing the presence of God, realizing that God is always with us at all times. Or like 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, to pray continually, to pray continually, to always realize that God is near and therefore to pray continually. Yesterday morning, I had a friend who sent me a uh, a little little note out of a commentary she was reading regarding prayer in her own personal quiet time, and it was so fitting. It fit right along with what I was talking about this morning in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually. Uh, the commentator writes, how is this possible? Paul's not talking about never leaving one's prayer closet physically, but he's referring to a prayerful disposition where the believer always lives within the presence of God. We cannot separate our lives physically into sacred spheres, church, or secular spheres, the office. God is everywhere, and this is His world. We cannot simply segment our lives into spiritual times, prayer, devotional, reading, ministry, and other times, work, leisure, chores. The eternal God is a king from dawn to dusk and beyond. In the context of this letter, the writer writes, that Paul tells this group to be always prayers, so that they recognize the presence and goodness of God at all times, and especially in difficult circumstances. 2020, first part of 2021. Prayer then becomes a term associated with a believing will that trusts God's benevolence and promises. To be an always prayer is to be constantly attentive to the work of God around us, and I would add, within us. Where is the place that you make space for God every day? We talk around here about God times and about taking time out every day and just spending some time alone in God's Word. What we do is every week we provide you actually with a God time. I'm going to really challenge you as we walk through the series. Use this God time. Maybe you're doing something else. That's great. Do that. But do this as well. Maybe do this with your family because every, every one of these relates to what we're talking about on that given week. It's been developed specifically for you as you walk through that week with your God time. But when is that, when is that time? You spend time alone with God. I, in the mornings for me, I get up early. I got to get up before Bella gets up. And, uh, and so I get up and I go downstairs and, and right in the kitchen, little countertop, got a little black stool. I sit in it. I grab my Bible. I grab my journal. And I just take a few moments and I just begin to etch out time with God. Just, just time of being alone with Him. Right now I'm walking through the Psalms. And I'm just taking two or three psalms at a time, and I'm walking through it, and I'll, I'll write down a verse that comes out of, out of a specific psalm that morning that, that just really, really impacts me, and I'll write it down, and I'll think about that, and then I move into my prayer time. I pray specifically for my kids, and there's certain prayers I've been praying for them for a long time. I just pray specifically for them. When I have a challenge in my home, I, I pray about that challenge. When I have a challenge in my life, I pray about that challenge. Many times I'll just write down a sentence or two that just gets my mind in focus and just kind of hands that over to the Lord, invites the Lord into that moment. The other morning, interesting, Wednesday morning, Wednesday morning I I sat down and the first thing I wrote is I just kind of, I just kind of penned it in my prayer, Lord Jesus, our world is just falling apart. It's a mess. And, uh, And then I reflected on Psalm 46 that morning, which is what Brad recited to us at the beginning of the service. I thought, how fitting. It's almost as if the Lord knew I needed that for that particular day. What is the place where you give God space? Make certain you do that. Maybe it is in the van after you drop the kids off from school. Maybe it is on the way to work where you're just praying out loud and people might look at you when they come up to the red light and they see you talking to no one and they think you're crazy. Well, you are crazy. But, but, uh, but it's that moment of just interacting with Him. Maybe it's a moment of great difficulty or great tension, and you just step back and you say, God, I'm going to create a space right now, create a place to give you some space in this. Because right now, the outward world is pushing in on me, and I need to give you the space to do the work that you need to do inside of me. You need to give God space. Second is this, and that is that really in many ways what Jesus does in this instruction, he says, pray humbly. He says, come as a child. I mean, one of the reasons a lot of times we struggle with prayer 
is that we're too focused on the how and not the who. I had a conversation with someone after the service this morning, and she said, I'm trying to figure out how. And I said, no, it's not the how. It's, it's the who. Who are you praying to? And, and within the context of that instruction, Jesus tells us who we're praying to. Who are we praying to? The, the what? The Father. Yeah, the Father. And, and, uh, and this word Father is an important word because it, it's the word that Jesus brings out is an affectionate term to Father. It's the, it's the word Abba. It means, it means the this, this sense of having a helpless dependence upon a heavenly Father. Abba, Father. It's a, it's a kind, gentle, caring, gracious, giving Father. It's the one word that, that shows up in a unique way in the life of Jesus. At age 12, when his parents find him on the doorsteps of the temple, and he said, where have you been all day? And he, says, he said, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? When he gives that story of the prodigal son, the first words the prodigal says when he comes home is, is this term father. It's the first word in the Lord's Prayer. When he goes to the cross, it's the first word on his lips of the cross, father, forgive them. And it's one of the last, father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And we focus on the who of our prayers, our prayers then become an act of worship because we begin to realize the situations that we may bring, be bringing to him that when we begin to focus on the who, we realize he can handle whatever it is that we're bringing to him. Paul Tripp writes about it. He gives a real good description of that. He says, prayer acknowledges God's existence, that, that God is there. It, 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 it bows to God's glory. It bows to his presence. It submits to God's plan, not my plan, but your will be done. It, it confesses our allegiance to his kingdom and what you want to do in and through us. It rests in God's provision that he's going to provide for my every need. It celebrates God's grace in the midst of my need for forgiveness, and it commits to God's work being done in me and through me. So don't miss this. When you pray, just pray humbly. Come as a child to the perfect father. It's not about how, it's about who. I know that for some of you, when you think about God the father, your your image of a perfect father is marred because of your earthly father. I mean, there's not a perfect father in this room. And some of you have had some fathers who have been far from perfect and have really created some challenges in your life. And yet what Jesus shows us, he shows us, he gives us this image of a perfect father that when when we are in a place of of distress or loneliness or fear or worry or brokenness or concern or disappointment. We have a father who puts his arm around us. He says, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Be in my presence. That when you have a problem that is so big and so challenging and your hand can't hold it, you have a father whose hand can handle it, that he holds all things in his hands. He holds the world in his hands, as Isaiah reminds us so well. And prayer is coming before a faithful father and a good father and a compassionate father and a giving father and a kind father and a just father and a loving father and a perfect father and an encouraging father and a sacrificial father and a forgiving father. That's your father. That's your father. And the longer you grow in your relationship with Christ, the more you know you need that kind of father in your life. Because the longer you grow, the more you're aware of your shortcomings, the more you're aware of your inability to handle things, the more you become aware of his presence in your life and your need for him. So come to him as a child, humbly, and then pray openly. Pray openly. In other words, just come as you are. Come as you are, because he knows everything there is to know about you. Anyway, I love Psalm 139. David writes this psalm, and it's a psalm that really speaks to the sanctity of our lives and, and the fact that we are, we are knit together in our mother's womb. and We're fearfully and wonderfully made. But David also writes this. He says, you've searched me, Lord. You know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, you know when I'm scattered, and my lying down when I may be feeling fear and and a sense of weariness. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. 
You hem me in behind and before. In other words, you protect and enclose me. And you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day. The darkness is as light to you. What's the psalmist saying? He's saying God knows it all. It's not about what you're about to pray. It's about who you're approaching. He sees it all. There's nothing hidden from his sight. He knows all your secrets. <laughs> He's already got it down. So, so just, just openly come before him and come as you are. God the Father invites us, invites us to come to him as we are tired and burdened and weary and guilty and convicted and sad and fearful and joyful, concerned and anxious. In fact, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus gives these words, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I went out yesterday on a shopping trip. I thought, I'm, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy a yoke, is what I'm going to do. I was looking for a huge yoke, is what I was looking for. And I walked into this antique mall, and I'm going through it, and I can't find a big yoke. And as I turn around, there's this yoke sitting right there. It's a coat hanger, but it's a, it's a yoke. <laughs> Even Brad asked last night, are you going to take those hooks out? I said, no, I'm going to hold them with the hooks. It's like, this is the yoke for today. When you think about a yoke in Jesus' day, there, there's an actual theory. I didn't share this in the other, in the other uh, uh, services, but there actually is a, is a little legend that's out there that Jesus is a carpenter, knew so much about yokes because he crafted yokes. And that his yokes were lighter <laughs> than the other yokes. So that's why he was able to say, my yoke is lighter. I don't know, maybe he had a sign over his door that said, light yokes sold here. I have no idea what it was, but... But he knew about yokes. But the truth is that when Jesus is sharing that illustration on Matthew 11, there's probably a high probability that there might have been a farmer out in the field. And he had an older oxen on this side who was teaching a younger oxen on this side how to manage the yoke. And how not to make the yoke so hard. But how to use the yoke so it's easy on you. Really what Jesus is saying here with the yoke is, the yoke is your life. It's your life. Why are you making your life so hard? Why are you letting the weight of the world fall on your shoulders? Why are you carrying all that worry? Why are you carrying all that anxiety? Why are you carrying all that guilt? Why are you carrying all that fear? Why are you letting so much the outer world dictate what's going on within your inner world? He said, I've come to give you life and to give you life to the full. The thief comes to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to weigh you down. That's not the kind of life I want you to have. So when you've got something weighing you down, when you've got something holding you back, bring it to me. Come to me with your weariness. Come to me with your burden. Come to me with your struggles and your difficulty and just bring them my way. Come as you are. And then the fourth is this, and that is pray boldly. In other words, ask what you need. Tell God what you need. Well, he already knows what I need. I know. <laughs> but there's something about telling the Father, this is what I need. I'm going to verbally tell you what I need right now. I'm going to ask you now to enter into this right now. I'm bringing it before you. I'm laying it at your feet. And in that moment of just verbally expressing us, we have a sense of confirmation in our heart that he heard us. We know he heard us. And we've been obedient to do what he's asked us to do. And now we've brought it before him. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he cried out a very authentic prayer of pain and sorrow. He wondered about his father's presence. Why have you forsaken me, he says. The same father that he just cried out to hours before in that little garden experience he had. He not only prayed authentically, 
He prayed boldly. So when you go before God, don't be shy with what you bring to him. And then trust him with it. And trust him with it. Matter of fact, Jesus gives us this prayer. And let's pray this prayer. And let's pray this prayer boldly. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Our Abba Father, Daddy Father, who's in heaven, this word is not about way up there. This word speaks about there, there, and here. God, I know you're here. Father, I know you're here. Hallowed be your name. You are mighty. You are strong. You are powerful. You are sovereign. You are gentle. You are kind. You are just. You are forgiving. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Make it come in my life. It's not about my kingdom. It's about what you want to do in me. Rule in me. And God, I have some needs today. And I'm going to bring my needs before you. Maybe they're the needs of my spouse. Maybe they're the needs of my children. Maybe they're the needs of my own personal struggles and challenges and and aspirations and hopes and dreams and desires. Maybe they're physical needs. Maybe they're financial needs. I'm going to bring them to you. And Lord, when it comes to those issues where I have failed you, forgive me. Forgive me. And as you forgive me, Lord, allow that to be a way of teaching me then how I must forgive others, to forgive as you have forgiven me. And Lord, when it comes to the trials that I walk through, give to me the wisdom that I need to see in the trial, to learn from the trial, to grow from the trial, so the enemy doesn't use the trial to lead me into deeper temptation and failure against you and deliver me deliver me from the schemes of the evil one now what is it what is it when we think about that little hand that little little hand reaching in and grabbing that big old thumb what is it in your life that's weighing you down what is it in your life that you need to bring before him and are you, are you being consistent in finding a place to give God space? Are you coming to Him as a child? Are you coming to Him as you are? And most of all, what is it that you need? Just ask Him for it. Because He is a good, good Father. Let's pray. Father, Abba, Father, we come before you and Lord, I I am so grateful for your presence, for the reminder of your strength and your might and your power, for the reminder from Psalm 139 that you see all and you know all and you know when it feels as if my world is dark. I'm sitting in the dark and you see in the dark. Lord, you you know every area of concern in my life. You know every area of anxiety in my life. You know my fears and you know how I like to control those things. And you know how, how I oftentimes allow the outer world to deeply impact the inner world and to distract me from a God who cares. Lord, I don't know what the concerns are in this room, but you do. I don't know what the needs are in this room, but you do. Maybe there are needs for strength and weakness. Maybe there are needs for comfort in the midst of loss. Maybe there's needs for healing in the midst of brokenness. Maybe there's some needs for forgiveness in the midst of failure and sin. God, 
you will meet all those needs. So Lord, as we sing this song, as we are reminded of your goodness in our lives, may we take the time, even in the midst of the song, to allow the words to to pour over us, to allow the words to get in our minds. So this next week, when we wake up every morning, I pray we'll wake up being reminded of what you give to us every day and being reminded of the fact that we have a good, good Father. As a result of that, that we'll find a place to give you space in every area of our life. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Let's stand together, shall we?
sing this together one more time. The steadfast love of the Lord never sees. His mercy. That verse um, out of Lamentations has carried me for years. And I hope that it carries you. This morning, I just want to tell you that if you've never received Christ your Savior, don't leave here without doing that this morning. I'm going to pray a prayer in a minute. Pray that prayer. I'd love to have some folks down front would be willing to pray with you afterwards if you need prayer. If you pray that prayer or you need a Bible to get you started for the year, stop by Guest Central. They've got a little journey pack they'd love to give you. It's got a Bible in it. and That'll get you started. Maybe just start with the God times and jumping through that. Give God space. Give Him a place in your life every day, through your day. You need it. We need it. Our nation needs it. A lot going on outward that can really have a tremendous, profound impact on the inward. I want to pray a prayer that we prayed last night. I sat down and wrote last night for our country. Let's pray. Father, we, have come, we come before you as children in awe of who you are. You are majestic. You are glorious. You are powerful. You are mighty. You are sovereign. You are merciful. We're thankful for your goodness and your kindness and your grace and your love and your justice. Your word tells us you hold all things together. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. You hold the king's heart in your hands. We need your forgiveness. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. We need you, Lord, to bring us to a place of humility and unity as a nation. Work in the hearts of our leaders. I pray you use this season to break down the walls of division and bring us to a place where we must work together to bring honor to each other and most of all to you. God, heal our land. Continue to convict Convict us of the various ways that we have opposed you and your word. And as a church, remind us to show kindness and graciousness and understanding and acceptance to each other as we work together to be a bright light of the good news of the gospel to our city, loving each other as you love us and loving our neighbor as you love them. May we be an example of reconciliation and restoration. And I pray we'll be a people of courage who stand together to proclaim the truth of your word to a world longing for hope. Now, Lord, if there's anyone in this room that they've never come to the place in this space, upstairs, online, of receiving you as their Savior, that in this moment of meeting with you, they would just simply say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that, Lord, you are God. You are the Son of God. You came to this earth. You went to the cross. You paid that price for my sins. You went to that tomb and that you rose again. And that you're alive and well. And I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to save me. And I ask you to be my Savior, my leader, my Lord, and my guide. God, I thank you for that work that you did for me, out of love for me. It's in the precious name of Jesus that I pray. Everybody said, amen. 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 See you later, bye. Have a great week. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there are members of our church online team or our staff who would love to do that. Simply click on the live prayer button at pccfw.tv or click the conversation bubble on the PCC at Home app. We encourage you to continue your worship through giving. Just click the Give button on the web or the app, or text the word GIVE. 
Finally, be sure to check the web or the app for the latest updates and at-home resources. We also share many updates through Facebook, Instagram, and our weekly e-news, so be sure to follow or subscribe. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.